Our quick review today is on the subject of headache. And um, of course, the first starting point anytime we see someone with headache is we don't want to just assume it's a benign or a primary headache syndrome like migraine or tension type headache. We always want to run through in our mind the possibility of a secondary headache. Uh, secondary headache is where the headache is a symptom of something underlying that is more serious. And so as we go through and talk about migraine, tension, cluster, um, we'll contrast with symptoms that suggest a secondary headache. Uh, doing a neurologic examination is very important in any patient with a headache, and uh, most of the secondary headaches have abnormal findings on neurologic examination. And it's always important we do an ophthalmoscopic exam in a patient with headaches. And so if someone has, for example, papilledema, of course, there's increased intracranial pressure. So that's not going to be a benign primary headache syndrome. Um, also, you really want to practice getting used to looking for venous pulsations. If you see them, it indicates normal intracranial pressure, and you are more uh, reassured about that patient. So let's go through a few secondary headaches. Of course, um, we don't need to really go through all the specific things that are mass lesions, but anything that creates a mass effect, whether it's a tumor or a bleed, will stretch the meninges and cause headache pain. Um, things that cause meningeal inflammation, such as meningitis or subarachnoid hemorrhage, will cause a headache, because that's where your pain fibers um, are located there in the, in the dural coverings around the brain. And hydrocephalus, also through increased intracranial pressure, will cause headaches. So just to remind you a little bit on subarachnoid hemorrhage, of course, we're going to look for this uh, diffuse subarachnoid blood in that kind of a situation. And remember where aneurysms are located that when they rupture, go into the subarachnoid space. They are, by and large, in the anterior portion of the circle of Willis. So here we have anterior communicating artery out of the trifurcation of the middle cerebral artery, and here at the junction of the internal carotid artery and the posterior communicating artery. So by and large, subarachnoid hemorrhage, patients have a bad headache and neck stiffness, but a pretty non-focal exam because the blood isn't going into the brain. It's going into the subarachnoid space around the brain. But an aneurysm here along the posterior communicating artery, remember the third nerve is there. And so a sudden onset headache there with a third nerve palsy uh, would tell us that this is a posterior communicating artery aneurysm that's ruptured into the subarachnoid space. And of course, lots of other things in and around the eye, like glaucoma, or in a child with otitis media. Patients may come in saying they have a headache, but it actually reflects an eye or a, an ear problem. Uh, less common dental pain uh, can sometimes be referred as a headache sinusitis, or in the elderly population, cervical arthritis often will present with a neck pain that sort of wraps forward to the back of the head. So let's go through a few um, secondary headaches in more detail. So these are ones we don't want to miss. So first, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The older term for this is pseudotumor cerebri. So the cartoon image here um, is meant to you know, kind of prime you for recognizing these patients. They tend to be overweight, younger women. And you can see here that she has tetracycline bottle and vitamin A, uh, just to kind of remind you that tetracycline use and excessive vitamin A use can also be associated with uh, this condition. And uh, so, again, the importance of looking in the eyes, because these patients will have papilledema. So the mechanism is not clear, but increasingly, uh, very common, we find uh, transverse sinus stenosis in these patients, and that is felt to be um, probably important in the pathophysiology of this condition, although there may also be some defect in CSF absorption through the arachnoid granulations. I already mentioned tetracycline and um, hypervitaminosis A, occasionally growth hormone. I think tetracycline would be the highest yield in terms of a board exam uh, relationship. So again, it's younger overweight women with headache, papilledema, and um, when you have papilledema, the blind spot is enlarged. That can sometimes be difficult to assess at the bedside, but I, I found more helpful 
that when you have papilledema and these patients bend their head around, such as to bend over and tie their shoes, shifting pressure around the optic nerve head will give these transient vis visual obscurations where they have brief episodes of blindness related to head position. So if you hear that, uh, that's a concerning symptom. So um, the, always when we see this kind of a situation, we start with an MRI scan, not with a lumbar puncture, because this could be a mass lesion, because it could be a tumor presenting with headaches and papilledema. And so uh, increasingly it's becoming standard practice to not just do an MRI, but an MR venogram, because more than two-thirds of these patients will have transverse venous sinus stenosis. Okay, so once we've done that, we'll do a lumbar puncture doc to document elevated opening pressure, and now we have our diagnosis. Um, just a note about lumbar puncture, uh, normal opening pressure is 15 to 18, but that assumes the patient is lying flat with their legs stretched out. So more than 25 is abnormal. And so very important you know the position because if someone is sitting and a lumbar puncture uh, is done, now look how much different you know the normal opening pressure is. So we need the patient lying flat, legs outstretched. Okay, and here's an example of this uh, stenosis here of the transverse uh, venous sinus, which you can see right here, and in this case on both sides. So treatment, I think what you need to know for boards is acetazolamide, which uh, decreases CSF production. That's probably how it helps uh, for headaches. If that doesn't work and the headache is more refractory, you know, our biggest concern in these patients is um, damage to the optic nerve head. And so these patients follow very closely with ophthalmology. Optic nerve fenestration can be done if there's a visual loss. And for a refractory headache, uh, sometimes um, shunting uh, can be helpful, done by neurosurgery. Okay, so I mentioned careful follow-up in an ophthalmology clinic, and this is what we like to see. The patient has papilledema, and then with treatment, we can see the resolution of that. Another secondary headache is giant cell arteritis, older term, but still frequently used, temporal arteritis. And so this is mainly a, a inflammation of the extracranial uh, vascular supply. So here we have the superficial temporal arteries, so they'll have pain in that area, um, typically. And also about two-thirds of patients will have jaw claudication. So again, that's extracranial uh, vascular supply. That's the most specific feature of giant cell arteritis. Uh, but the intracranial vascular can be affected as well, especially involving the ophthalmic artery. So the biggest complication we want to avoid in giant cell arteritis is blindness. And the rate of that is actually fairly high if this condition goes untreated for long. Okay, since systemic uh, symptoms can occur as well, especially polymyalgia rheumatica, kind of a diffuse, achy pain, uh, sometimes uh, just really low energy and even a low-grade fever can go along with that. So when we suspect giant cell arteritis, you should always do a sedimentation rate and a C-reactive protein. These are virtually always abnormal and uh, typically should be significantly elevated. Uh, we would then go on to uh, confirm the diagnosis with a temporal artery biopsy, and we want to pretty quickly get to steroids. You can start steroids before a temporal artery biopsy, um, but if you have the steroids on board for too long waiting for the biopsy, it can impair uh, the sensitivity of finding those inflammatory cells on the biopsy. Um, there's a new monoclonal antibody that targets the IL-6 receptors. I think that's more than you'd need to know for boards, um, and this looks like it's a pretty significant breakthrough for treatment of giant cell arteritis, but it's fairly new. Now, spontaneous intracranial hypotension is a condition where there is a spontaneous um, leak uh, due to a dural tear. This is really the same thing that happens uh, after a lumbar puncture where you don't get a good sealing when you remove the spinal needle. But in this case, it, it comes on uh, spontaneously, more likely to happen in patients that have significant degenerative disc disease. And the distinctive thing about this is the headache is completely gone, lying flat, or basically gone, but when patients sit or stand up, they have an excruciating headache. 
So that's quite specific and should suggest uh, this condition. All right, so how do we make a diagnosis? Well, if you do an MRI scan, we get this very pronounced enhancement of the meninges in this condition, and sometimes we can even see where that dural tear is located at. If we do a lumbar puncture, we find a low pressure. Okay, so now we have our diagnosis, and treatment is just like you would treat a post-lumbar puncture headache that doesn't go away. We take some of the patient's blood, inject it into the epidural space, which seals off the leak, and uh, this can, uh, in many patients, just immediately resolve the headache. Now, moving on to some benign headache syndromes, of course, migraine is the one you need to know the most about. Um, you know, older thought, it was all about vasoconstriction, vasodilation. Now that is known to be uh, really an epiphenomenon of something much more complex going on in the brain. So you should be aware of the cortical spreading depression, which seems to kick off a migraine headache. It isn't really known exactly what causes this, but you want to associate with this, uh, this with the aura of the headache. So the visual changes, for example, that the patient might have, this is also associated with uh, vasoconstriction. And this really is, you know, like an electrical storm that happens in the brain. There's a lot going on. Uh, really, you get a disruption of the blood-brain barrier um, as a result of this. And then that leads to the headache, in which case uh, you have vasodilation. Um, during the headache, there is a significant release of pain neurotransmitters, and especially CGRP. And that is huge in current thinking about the pathophysiology of migraine headache. There's irritability at neurovascular junctions with um, abnormal CGRP. We'll come back to that um, in terms of therapy. So at least half of patients that have migraines have a strong family history, but there can be a lot of other environmental, head trauma, other factors that can play into migraine headaches. You can see how common it is, a little bit more common in women. And uh, peak age is between the ages of 30 and 39, but of course children can have migraines, the elderly can have migraines. Those are just the peak years. All right, so classic description of a migraine is an incapacitating headache. So if someone has a tension type headache, you know, they can tough it out, go to work or whatever, but generally someone with a migraine can't function. They're incapacitated. Pain's often described as throbbing on one side more than the other. Nausea, vomiting is very common. And always ask about light and sound sensitivity. These are classic features, photophobia, phonophobia for migraine headache. You're allowed to have a little light sensitivity with a tension type headache, but in a migraine, it's quite severe. Patients need to go into a dark room. And uh, duration can vary, but um, an average would be somewhere between 6 and even up to 24 hours. So about a quarter of patients have an aura, and uh, the classic aura are the visual symptoms. And this can take on several forms. Um, here, a loss of vision in the central location, kind of a donut uh, distortion, uh, bright colored lights, uh, this kind of fortification spectra here. And so ask a patient about any kind of symptoms that they have like this prior to a headache coming on. Some patients will get these, and it's not followed by a headache. But uh, we would call that a uh, silent migraine or a migraine equivalent. And sometimes the aura can even present like a stroke. So if you have a young individual that has episodes of aphasia or even hemiplegia or homonymous hemianopia, um, that, you know, assuming that individual does not have stroke risk factors, that probably is going to be a migraine phenomenon. Very important to recognize that uh, women that have migraine with aura, if they smoke, have a significantly increased risk of stroke. So we need to be very aware of that. And, um, you know, um, uh, this is with oral contraceptive use. So that's not an appropriate uh, mix, oral contraceptives, smoking, and migraine with aura. So generally we try to use the lowest estrogen component or some other form of birth control um, in that setting. Okay, don't memorize the triggers, but stress is certainly the most common. Hormonal changes are common, and uh, these are individualized, but, you know, 
patients frequently will have more than one uh, trigger for their migraines. Okay, so in terms of abortive treatments, lots of things are used over the counter. Um, aspirin, Tylenol, non-steroidals, lots of the over-counter medications like Excedrin have caffeine in it. And so these can be helpful, just be careful. Kind of the magic rule of thumb is if someone's using an abortive for migraines more than about seven or eight times a month, seven or eight days per month, then their risk of rebound headache goes up substantially. All right, so beyond this, the serotonin agonists or the triptans are very effective. Sumatriptan uh, is the first of, I think now, eight, maybe nine triptan medications on the market. So it's a selective 5-HT1B, 5-HT1D receptor agonist. Um, I think this is still probably the one that you need to know about um, on boards. So it does result in vasoconstriction, but that's in parallel with actually a reduction in uh, release of CGRP. Remember sumatriptan and the triptans are contraindicated, just think vascular. So stroke, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, um, uncontrolled hypertension, stroke. Uh, we don't want to use triptans in that situation. Now when someone's having three or more migraines per month, um, and use common sense. If someone has one migraine a month, but that migraine lasts for 10 days, you know, then we're going to use preventive therapy. So um, for years, we had one of three big options in terms of preventive therapy. First, our tricyclic antidepressants work great. Um, I think boards still likely ask more about amitriptyline, but in practice, every neurologist that I know uses nortriptyline because it's better tolerated. It has fewer of the uh, cholinergic side effects. Okay, so you need to warn patients about sedation, dry mouth, constipation when you start these medications. Beta blockers, especially propranolol is used most often. Biggest contraindication here is asthma. Occasionally if someone has depression it can um, have a negative effect there, but the big one is asthma, uh, COPD. Wouldn't want to use it in that situation. And then the anticonvulsants. Topiramate is used most often because it's uh, better tolerated than valproic acid. Uh, in general. Okay, so these are our three options in terms of oral medications. If we've exhausted those and the patient is still having poorly controlled migraines, then we'll move on to botulinum toxin injections. Um, this lasts for three months, quite effective, and so patients come in every three months for their injection. How does this work? Well, um, so we think of uh, botulinum toxin and botulism as member involving the snare proteins, um, not allowing release of acetylcholine at neuromuscular junctions. But these snare proteins are also involved at neurovascular junctions involved in the release of CGRP. So when we, when we inject Botox in a distribution, uh, trigeminal nerve uh, distribution, we're reducing that CGRP neurovascular instability. Okay, and I really shouldn't say Botox, uh, botulinum toxin, because there are a variety of botulinum toxins that can be injected, and uh, they're really equally effective. Now, newer, so I think not uh, a board question, but certainly the, the new big thing in migraine for several years now, we have these anti-CGRP uh, monoclonal antibodies. So arenamab here was the first, but there are several others out. Um, these are generally... Um, Self-inject medications, arinumab, for example, lasts for four weeks for uh, migraine prevention. So this is a really significant breakthrough in terms of treatment. Okay, next, cluster headache, which in an umbrella term fits under what we call a trigeminal autonomic cephalgia. So cluster headaches, uh, the, probably the pathophysiology here involves the hypothalamus. And uh, remember, there is a kind of a circadian rhythm to um, cluster headaches. Here's the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which sets the circadian clock. And so patients that have cluster headaches will often tell you, boy, they can almost set their watch when their cluster headache is going to come on, which is a really interesting phenomenon. But that kind of relates here to the hypothalamic, um, hypothalamus uh, involvement. And so what happens here in cluster? Well, we know patients have tearing and nasal stuffiness, 
And this relates to these uh, descending pathways from the hypothalamus that activate parasympathetics. Okay, but also there is, um, here we can see the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract. Remember that's pain information. It's the continuation of the substantia gelatinosa in the spinal cord. And so this is important in the, why these patients um, have head pain, pain around the eye. Okay, we also have distortion here around the internal carotid artery where the sympathetics are trying to travel up to the pupil. And so these patients can also have a Horner's syndrome um, during their headache. So patients with cluster headache are almost always men, about 85% smoke, pains around the eye, much shorter duration than a migraine, maybe 30 minutes or so. And unlike migraine, and this is really key, there's no photophobia or phonophobia. So these patients can have a horrible um, eye headache, but they can be often pacing the floors, walking around, sunlight, doesn't bother them at all. Very different than a migraine. Okay, and remember the autonomic uh, symptoms that I just mentioned. So in terms of abortive, high flow oxygen works great um, for aborting a headache. Uh, the injectable form of sumatriptan is very helpful, but you know, the patient then still has to suffer with that cluster headache. So if we can prevent it, because oftentimes when a patient is in a cycle of having cluster headaches, um, they'll have lots of them. So typically we'll give a short dose of uh, prednisone, uh, maybe seven days or so, and then verapamil is considered the drug of choice for prevention of cluster headaches. Uh, works quite well. Verapamil, calcium channel blocker, uh, does not help patients with migraines, but it works well for cluster. Tension type headaches, extremely common, like migraines, a little more common in women. Um, and oftentimes people that have migraines also have tension type headaches, so the two to go together. Um, you know, it's often said these are muscle contraction headaches, but if we want to be more specific, I would say this, a heightened sensitivity of CNS pain pathways and with peripheral activation of myofascial uh, pain receptors. That would be a little more uh, accurate uh, description. So triggers are similar to migraine, stress, um, hormonal changes, um, and so on. Um, chronic daily headaches are a headache that is present more than 50% of the time, often overlaps a lot, again, with tension type headaches. These respond well to tricyclic antidepressants. Okay, so if you have someone that just has a very frequent tension type headache, um, we'd want to go that direction. Remember that anyone that has a very frequent headache, we always want to be primed for medication overuse headache. So if patients are overusing opioids, uh, even triptans, caffeine, furanol over the counter, which is a medication that has butalbital, caffeine um, in it, uh, these if these are used more than seven or eight times per month, that patient is at a risk for developing this chronic daily headache. Endomethacin responsive headaches are less common, but they're so unique in that the duration is just four seconds. So that's unlike anything else really we've talked about here in this lecture. Very intense, short duration headache. They may have autonomic symptoms like someone with cluster headache. Um, and these can come on spontaneously or sometimes can be related to exertion such as sexual activity, weightlifting. These are often called ice pick headaches. Okay, and as the name indicates, endomethacin works great. Um, so if it's triggered by something like sexual activity, you can take endomethacin prior to that and it'll prevent the headache from coming on. Finally, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, like endomethacin responsive headache, this is the other one where the pain is very brief, but now the distribution is not in the head, it's in the face, almost always in the V2 distribution. Patients will describe it as an electrical pain. Uh, this is excruciating. And uh, you want to think of two things in terms of uh, what causes this. Most often it's a vascular loop that compresses, compresses the trigeminal nerve fibers. In a younger patient, though, with trigeminal neuralgia, um, demyelination that involves the pons, where the trigeminal nerve fibers enter the pons, um, can trigger these pain circuits. And so, basically, we always want to do an MRI scan in trigeminal neuralgia. In a young person, to look for MS, and an older individual, to look for 
vascular compression of the trigeminal nerve. But there can be some other mass lesions as well. And so trigeminal neuralgia is always triggered by jaw movement, eating, chewing, talking, brushing teeth. Patients can lose a lot of weight just because they desperately do not want to bring on that pain, so they will stop um, chewing, brushing their teeth, and so on. So you can't abort a pain that lasts for a few seconds. You have to prevent it. And so the drug of choice is carpamazepine. There are a number of other options, but that's the first one that we go to. Uh, probably gabapentin would be next. Uh, baclofen perhaps would be a third uh, option. And if we do an MRI scan, um, here we can see the trigeminal nerve exiting here, the pons, and there we can see a vascular loop uh, compressing on the trigeminal.